Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we are going to be discussing questions on Christianity. This is going to be a highly interactive discussion. Just want to see what's on people's mind. Um, I want to understand, you know, um, I want to ask people, you know, when they think of Christianity, what are the big questions for them? Uh, what are the deepest questions? What are the questions that they would most like answers to whether they would want to come up with the answers themselves if there is something that is puzzling if there is something um in terms of the, something that is really really important to you um so use whatever criteria that you want to use to put the questions down um so go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to put a question down i would ask you to first ask the question in voice and then type it up in in chat uh, so we will have it in two different forms so we'll be able to go ahead and process it you know everybody will be able to process it better once we have got a number of questions on the table we will go ahead and organize them we will vote on which ones people want to discuss most and we will start with those uh, questions. So uh, let's go with David, followed by Will. David, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, my question, uh, you know, since I seen this, that you were doing this is recently, I've been, um, you know, looking at the idea of the relationship of Socrates and Christianity. Okay, so what I'm going to do is read you um, the question that I have come up with, and that is that uh, Socrates referred to life as being separated between uh, the physical and also the spiritual or the mortal and the immortal. Um, and my question, is it possible to separate Christianity in the same manner? And is there a physical understanding that is different from the spiritual understanding with inside of Christianity? That's my question. Wonderful, excellent, excellent. And if you could uh, put the question in the chat, so we would have, so people will have uh, ample opportunity of uh, meditating on the questions that are being uh, put forth. Uh, next up is going to be, give me just a second, is going to be Will, Gary, Joe, and David. You can put as many as two questions. You can give a little bit of explanation, but not too long explanation. Uh, let's uh, keep it to questions. Will, go ahead. Thanks, Srikant. Yeah, I saw a documentary recently with a professor of theology, Oxford University, and he was talking about the Sumerian texts. And he was saying that they preceded the Old Testament and the Torah by, I think it was thousands of years, the Sumerian text. But he said that the Old Testament and the Torah basically mirror these Sumerian texts, which preceded them by thousands of years. And I'm interested in that and how the whole thing, how the whole story emerged. And nobody seems to want to know about the Sumerians. And their word for God was quite astonishingly i thought sky people hmm. uh, wonderful fascinating there was a pro professor of theology told me that thank you Excellent. thank you thank you will uh relationship between the sumerian thought and the bible and christianity wonderful all right next up is going to be gary gary go ahead Um, so this is a question I've actually, uh, brought up in the gospel of John lectures a little bit is that we have this command to love one another, which is derived from, you know, two old Testament passages. Um, it also appears in just about every moralistic religion we find it in Confucianism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, um, Jainism, uh, Hinduism, you know, some aspect of this do unto others or, you know, love one another as I've loved you. Um, and I guess my question is, <clears throat> you know, it, immediately I'm thinking of Martin Luther and Vladimir Putin both use the love command as justifications for war. 
And so what does the love command me mean to you? And, um, and do you see any exceptions to it? You know, as Martin Luther and Vladimir Putin both see, actually, they don't see any exceptions to it. They just think going to war is an expression of love. Um, and so, yeah, how broad is, is the love command? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And Gary, what you texted me a question when as, as the first response to what question you would like to ask, and that was, how does God speak to you? So I'm going to put yes. that also as a question. Thank you. How does God speak to you? Um, all right. So we got four questions so far. Uh, let's go with Joe, followed by David Miller. Joe. Um, so actually, mine was actually going to be along the same lines uh, as to the one that uh, Gary had texted to you is that just simply, what does it mean to know Christ? What does it mean to know God? Okay, very good. What does it mean to know God? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is going to be David Miller. David, go ahead. Yes, I have a very simple um, uh, ultimate sort of question. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did God create imperfection? Very good. If God is if God is perfect, then everything He has created is not is imperfect. <laughs> it's not, it's not perfect like Him. Okay. Why did God create imperfection? Excellent. All right. Uh, next up is going to be Jacob. Jacob, what's what question would you like to put on the table? Yeah, my question is. How does one become born of God, Good, according to according to the New Testament? What does one become? How does one become born of God, according to the New Testament? Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Am I missing anybody? Um, let's see. Does anybody else want to put a question on the table? Go ahead. Katie and has one in the chat. Katie, go ahead and read out your question. Yeah, I, I find it interesting to explore what the conflicts were in the Bible because the Pharisees are kind of the strict legalists. They're kind of like, uh, you know, no exceptions, a law is a law, and we have Jesus as a spirit of the law. But what other conflicts do we see within Christianity itself? Okay, uh, just a second, Miss Katie. What conflicts do we see in Christianity? Okay, uh, let's see. Um, okay. Christianity. Okay, so what I want to do, uh, Grant, you had a question. Yes, Go ahead. yes. Um, I'll put it in uh, chat right now. I have two, two questions which have puzzled me, <clears throat> excuse me, quite a bit. The first one is, why do Christians ignore or even deny that their Protestant sects and churches sprang from Catholicism and inherit most of their ideal ideology from Catholicism? Mm -hmm. uh, very many of these, especially fundamentalists, uh, claim Catholicism was all wrong, and they're right, and so on and so forth. Uh, number two is, why are Christians so divided? Uh, it's supposed to be the same gospel, the same message, uh, the same uh, Bible passages. Um, 20,000 plus individual churches, uh, possibly more, possibly as much as 80,000 just in America alone. And each one of them believe that only they have the correct truth and only they are the one true church. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh Evanique, what questions would you like to put on the table? So um, my question is one, why is it that Christians condemn paganism even though their traditions are based out of paganism? That's my one for right now. Okay, very good. Um, excellent. So how do we proceed? on this 
What I want to do is I want to start with more fundamental questions first. Um, I see three of them here. Um, and then we will go from there. Um, I will put all of them together, you know, that is Gary's questions, Joe's question, and Jacob's question. Um, and we'll discuss these three, and then we'll go from there. So Gary asked, how does God speak to you? Joe asks, what does it mean to know God? And Jacob asked, how does one become born of God according to the New Testament? Okay, so those are the three questions that I want to put on the table first. Uh, the reason I've chosen those is that those are the most fundamental. I, I see them as being more fundamental and then we will go slowly. There is a constellation of questions about conflicts, the KT and the two questions um, or even uh, two questions by Grant and the question by Evanique. Uh, and we can throw in the question of will in there in terms of patterns within Christianity itself and interaction between Christianity and other, um, other religions or other philosophies. We'll throw in Socrates also there. So, the, you know, we'll, so first we'll look at the, the heart of Christianity then we will look at maybe conflicts within Christianity. Then we'll look at relationships between Christianity and other, other systems of thought. And then we will take whatever else is left. So we got those three questions. How does God speak to you? It's question number one. Question number two, what does it mean to know God? And question number three, how does one become born of God according to the New Testament? Now you can pick any one of these questions. Um, let's do it one at a time. So you can choose one of the questions to answer and go ahead and answer them. The other, the next person can choose any one of these other. If you want to speak about two or three of these, just come back and type an exclamation mark so we can get as many, as many answers on the table as we possibly can. All right, so go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to um, answer any of these questions. Joe, can you do me a favor and type in these three questions in the chat as saying one is how does God speak to you? Two is what does it mean to know God? And three, how does one become born of God? according to the New Testament. And you should be able to cut and paste from what has been posted so far. All right, folks, so you're welcome to now type an exclamation mark and comment. Try to answer any of these questions. Don't take more than two minutes because we want to get as many answers to as many questions as we can. So go ahead and type an exclamation mark. We're going to start with will followed by David. So Will is answering the question number two. Go ahead, Will. Uh, yeah, and sorry, I thought we were voting on which of those three we were going to discuss first. So I thought number two was the most interesting. Uh, uh, what does it mean to know God? And then, and so I was just basically voting for that because I find that the most interesting. Yeah, what does it mean to know God? And then, uh, so, you, you know, God is a word. Uh, what does God mean? We, I mean, we need a definition. I guess the most fundamental definition would be the ultimate creator. Uh, to me, God is, if there's, God is just a word. To me, God represents ultimate reality. And I think ultimate reality is beyond human comprehension. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Next up is going to be David. David, go ahead. Um, you know, to me, the thing is, like, um, it says, how does uh, one become uh, born of God? And the thing is, to me, it's quite clear in John 3.16, God says, uh, you know, in order to um, whatever, you need to be born again. And the thing is, uh, that's what Jesus says. And the thing is, Jesus also refers to um, that in order to take and come to him and to understand him, 
you must be born again as little children. Well, the thing is, I'm going to relate this to Socrates right quick, is that Antisthenes, one of his students of Socrates' students, said that, you know, the most important thing a person can do is to unlearn what is not true, which basically is the same teachings that Jesus Christ is teaching in John 3, 16, and then also the fact that, uh, you know, you must be born again. So in reality, in order to take and, you know, be born again, you have to realize that there's something wrong in your life and that there needs to be a change that needs to take place, period. And in searching for that change, this sort of being born again or this relationship with Jesus Christ or God or Christianity happens, period. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Grant, go ahead. Uh, Grant, you need to unmute. Sorry, um, there's a few people in front of me. Uh, would that make more sense for them to go first? Um, I've, I've evaluated all of that, and you're next. Okay, so what I put down is that I'm a sentient deist. So deists uh, basically believe that God does not interfere with the life on Earth or the universe, doesn't have to, because the clock, um, the universe runs as clockwork. So to me, um, a person saying they talk to God, they're either um, misinterpreting what's really going on or they're perhaps mentally ill. Because there's a lot of mentally ill people that claim to talk to God and be Jesus and Moses and so forth. Now, um, the answer to number two is, in my perspective, is very simple. It's cosmic consciousness, which was first, um, the, coin, the term was coined in 1901 uh, and a book by the same name by Dr. Richard Murray Spock. There's an excellent article on Wikipedia, and you can find the uh, text uh, online for free. And what happens is it's uh, it's essentially enlightenment for a um, brief period of time. Your mind expands to become one with the universe. Now, I won't say God. Some people would use the God term, but I think the word God has been extremely anthropomorphized and misused throughout the centuries, millennia, so I don't use that. Great. Thank you, Grant. Uh, next up is Jill. Um, I'm tempted to, uh, to answer, what does it mean to be born of God? But I still have to think about what that actually is meaning, because I'm tempted to say rebirth, but I think it's something else. Uh, what does it mean to know God? I think uh, in the Christian sense that it's uh, having a personal relationship uh, with God um, so that uh, you uh, feel like that God is present in every day of your life and, and he, that it's, uh, you know, part of every action in your life so that there is a uh, a way of, you know, sanctifying one's actions. Uh, and that leads to sometimes a, uh, a rebirth or a transformation of something that it was once where uh, we could say that uh, you were in darkness. Maybe this is why a lot of people feel like they've come from something that, you know, that was unfulfilling or uh, taking you away from uh, true virtue and bringing you closer to God. Uh, and I think that that's what it means to, to, to know God in the Christian sense, uh, because I think there are a lot of different ways to know God. Thank you. Um, Jacob was the one who put the question three and he has a detailed um, quote. So Jacob, could you go ahead and talk about uh, your answer to your question? Well, a good starting point is um, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. So I'll read it. <clears throat> During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he, Jesus, offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one, God, the Father, who could save him, him, Jesus, from death, the miseries of sin, not the physical death, but the miseries of sin. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. 
Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. In other words, he wasn't until this moment. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And if you look at the Greek, obey, the words are walk as he walked, literally. The words are walk as he walked. <clears throat> and someone mentioned uh, they were confused about what it means to be born of God. And I'll also put a verse uh, from the Bible, uh, from the New Testament, uh, talking about what does it mean to be born of God? <clears throat> I could read that if you want, or I could do that at another please. time. No, please go ahead. Okay, this is uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 to 10. The one, referring to the one born of God, and we'll see that in the, in, in the verses following, in the following sentences. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he, referring to Jesus, is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. No one who is born of God, this is where, again, this is where the use of the word born of God is. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. And then I point out that the word righteous in the Greek is the exact same word used for Jesus and for those born of God. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. That was great. Let us stay on this question for, for a moment. Uh, so let's just focus on this question. What does, how does one become born of God? as per the New Testament, okay? Um, Evanique, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, that was the one I was gonna comment on. So I think um, from a Christian perspective, I think Jacob pretty much covered it. So I'm gonna go into the second part of the answer that I had. I think when one is born again, and if you're not Christian, I think it's, um, transforming your life like you see you know we talk about before in the Gita and other meetups um we talk about you know you're seeking something you know something isn't right so when you know something isn't right in your life you take the steps to transform it and not just change it's really changing your lifestyle changing wh who you are what you do what you say how you act um, I think being born again is changing who you are and, and changing it into the person that you want to be. It's being born because if you think about Christ Christianity, when people accept Jesus and they're and they accept his way of life and they choose to obey Jesus and his teachings, they're changing their way of life. They're changing everything about them. So it's almost like the death of their old life and it's the birth of a new life. And if you think about it in terms of just pregnancy, you know, you're there for nine months and then, you know, you're born, right? Same thing. It's like that part of your life is over. That part where you were in your mom's womb is over. And now you're transforming into this new life. And we do it throughout life. Like we, you know, hopefully all of us transform from being a child to a teenager to an adult. And every time we go through those different stages, that part of life is over. That part of life has died. So when you're not a baby anymore and, you know, you turn, you, you transform into a child, you know, you become a little more independent, your lifestyle changes, 
you know, your mom's not taking care of you as much. You're running, but, you know, your mom's still looking out for you. I think after childhood, there's teenage where, you know, your mom isn't as, as clinging to you as much, but, you know, you're, you're exploring your independence, the young adulthood, so on and so on. So I think you see this born again in different stages of life, but I think being born again is choosing it, is when you choose to transform your life. You choose to, you know, take on a different type of life. And that's what Christianity, that's what you're doing when you are born again, you're choosing to take on that life. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Next up is Gary. Gary, go ahead. Oh, sorry about it. I, Okay, go ahead, uh, Gary. Apologies. Oh, we're good. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I puzzle over a lot of this because some of our questions are, um, are biblical studies questions and not theological questions and so that the the answer within the text is something that can be more or less ascertained through a study of the of the historical milieu in which it was written if, if and i just say that preemptively and so when we talk about being born of god um <clears throat> like the whole idea of us of sin as something we do or or our actions serving a means to an end those are very modern concepts whereas in our first century milieu they're talking about who are you becoming it's it's about it's about transformation and to be born again means to become somebody entirely new and you see this juxtaposition of life and death continually and so we're continually putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the old man has passed away and we are a new person that is being born. And um, I like that um, we're quoting John in here because <clears throat> that, that links back to a um, question that David asked about Socrates of life is because John talks about this, this experience of eternal life, which is lived in the present, you know? And so we're talking about that being born again, that living this new life, living this, it's a qualitative thing that that's taking place. Um, and I think especially in John, but I think you could carry it over to the epistles and the gospels is he's kind of saying that there's, um, there's something that logically follows if you believe in the resurrection and your, your lectures, previous lectures, Tricon, really kind of focus on the preeminence of the cross. You know, Paul says, like, I preach nothing but the cross of Christ. You know, and, and what we're getting at is the fact that the cross is the death, and it's followed immediately by the resurrection, you know, three days later. And and we have that, this is the, the paradigm of our death and rebirth as Christians. And so especially in the Gospel of John, there's this He's saying it logically follows that if you really believe that Jesus died and rose again and ascended into heaven, then you are going to become reborn, you yourself. It's not possible to continue living on that old life, you know, knowing knowing what we know. We always ask that question, if, I, if only I knew then what I know now, you know, how I would live my life so differently. And that's really what the, the gospel of the New Testament is getting at, is that the good news really is that good, is if you really believe this, if you heard this news, it is in itself transformative of the person. Um, but back to our, our notion of, of virtue ethics is we've been habituated maybe for our whole lives to act and behave a certain way. And so that takes some cultivation in order to grow into this new person that we're becoming. We're, we're going to be dragged down by all of these old habits, you know, their short tempers or whatnot. Um, and it's, it's going to take time to learn how to love, to learn how to become the new person that we're being called to be. That's, that's my sense of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, next up is going to be uh, Joe followed by me. Uh, Joe, go ahead. I'll keep it brief. I mean, I, essentially, the way it was described uh, just a moment ago uh, by Jacob, I think it does become a little bit more clear. Um, and 
I think uh, Gary had touched upon it um, in the Gospel of John uh, in 17.3. Uh, Jesus defined eternal life, saying that this is eternal life, that they may not know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, in a way, this is what it means to be born of God, is actually to be born that it's God's child, um, and that God exists in everyone. Uh, so that is what, uh, you know, that's how I'm viewing it. Um, it, and I appreciate the clarity that uh, that um, Jacob provided, because I think that there are a lot of different ways of interpreting that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I, I, I've spent more, most time with uh, John, so I'm going to just focus on uh, start with John. I mean, the place where I see this most clearly is uh, John 3, starting with verse 3. Jesus answered uh, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the born again can also be translated as born from above. Um, and Naval Godard has a very beautiful take on that. So we are born from the womb of our mother. Being born from above is taking the word into our head, into our consciousness. This is like the, this is like the skull. The skull is like the grave of Jesus. You're, you're, you're letting your past thoughts die and you're taking in the word. And that word is transforming your life, creating a new life. It's like taking a seed and planting it into your own head. And that transforming you. So that action of taking in, saying yes to God. And here of God, you know, for us, I think it is it is Christ who is the intermediary. It is the word that is the intermediary. And that is the thing that transforms you. So that is one take on it. Uh, how does one become born of God by taking in the word and letting it flow, flow through you uh, and shape and reshape your life and do that not just once, but this is a this is an eternal issue that you do this all the time. At any point of time you do it, that is the effect of it. It is being born again. It is leaving behind your past thoughts, your past emotions, your past actions, past life, and living up to this new ideal. Um, but let's go with, let's go forward with uh, John 3. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So water is taking away your past, taking away your sins. That's the baptism of John the Baptist. And of the spirit, It is that is the baptism of Christ. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
Now here, the, the word spirit is pneuma. It is on one hand wind and on the other hand spirit. The same word is being used and once translated in this passage as wind, once translated as pneuma. This is the description of the Holy Spirit that has been released. So it's like the, it is that spirit can act through you. It is the living water at the core of your being, operating and transforming you. It is available to you at all times. So that's, you know, looking at it from the spirit, Holy Spirit perspective, but you can look at it through the word perspective, which is, um, so it is it's like the seed. So you take the word inspired by the spirit. So you're inspired by the spirit using the word as the way to move towards God. And that, so that, that's the part of the Trinity. So it's you have to look at the other two parts of the Trinity, the spirit and the word to see how, how we are born um, of, of God. Um, next up is uh, John. Oh, no, not John, sorry, Will. I'm sorry, I'm reading too much of John. Yeah. Thanks, Srikant. Oh, look, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm really intrigued by the teachings of the Bible because they're so intricate and sophisticated and um, detailed, and people believe it without any evidence whatsoever, I would say. There's no evidence whatsoever, but people sort of live their lives by, by this. But the other thing which I'm intrigued by, genuinely intrigued by, is why this so-called God waited 200,000 years before no, no, no. Uh, Will, let's go step by step. No questions? Okay. No, no we, we're just addressing the question, how can one be born of God? Yeah, but I find it hard to be born of God when he waited 200,000 years. Like, he needs to get his act together. Seriously. If I'm going to follow someone, he needs to be more punctual than 200,000 years late. Just saying. Okay, sure. So let, let me answer that. Uh, the, the best answer I have that I've seen is by Philo of Alexandria, who looks at Genesis and Logos in Genesis. When God speaks, that is the word. So the word is there right in the beginning. Word is simply the, the structure through which things are formed. So, uh, so there, is, there is a lot of that, but, but I don't want to go back and forth on that. Uh, there, there is a connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it is really trying to, you know, the word is trying to capture these universal laws that shape everything. And that, uh, so that, that's what it's about. But let's go back to uh, the answering of the question uh, with Gary, and then we'll come back to this issue, we will look at it as conflicts between, as we are going to look at conflicts within Christianity first, then we are going to look at relationships between Christianity, paganism. We can use science and look at you know Christianity and science at that point. That would be the right point to bring it up. Uh, next up is Gary. Gary, go ahead. Actually, Dave, I sent a, tried to send a question to David and since then, all of his requests to speak have gone straight to me rather than the group chat. So sure. I'm putting in my explanation because David wants to talk. Okay, so let, let's go ahead with uh, David first and then Gary. David, go ahead. Okay, um, the thing is, uh, this is wonderful, you know, listening to everything. The input through the spirit is wonderful. But, you know, I noticed that, you know, John 3.16 refers to the spirit. And the spirit is so key to everything and the words and everything that Sri Khan just said. But in John chapter um, chapter four, when Jesus is talking to the lady at the well, okay, and the thing is, he just got to describing to her her entire life and what had happened, and she couldn't believe all this stuff. Anyway, Jesus goes on to take and say that God is a spirit, and God must be worshipped in spirit. So the thing is, the presentation of God from Genesis all the way through Jesus Christ is all through the Spirit. And the thing is, we have to remember that Jesus Christ claims to be the Son of God. So him being the Son of God is not a physical being or something that we can see, 
but is the spirit. And as like in John 3, 16 refers to the spirit, it comes and goes. And the thing is, that's what's so unique and so beautiful about Jesus Christ, because he speaks to every single person on their own level at their own time in life and is able to relate relate to them, you know, the his words and his teachings that is the way that God actually speaks to each one of us if we take and can open our minds up to the teachings that Jesus Christ gives us, to me, especially through John and also through Matthew, because through Matthew, he gives us the law. And if we can look at that law as a completion of the Mosaic law, it all goes together and synchronizes together into just some beautiful, I don't know what to say, but it's just something so spectacular, it's unreal. But it's all the spirit talking through these words to each and every one of us. And, you know, that's what I have to say. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, great observations. You know, I was thinking of um, John 4 and the, you know, that the point about spirit, you know, worship in, in spirit and God is spirit. Uh, absolutely. Beautiful. Uh, next up is Gary. I, I actually don't have anything to say. I was just making certain that David got his shot to say, to speak. Okay. Okay. Understood. Uh, no, no problem. No problem. All right. So let's take the other two questions. Let's see if we have any answers. So let's take the question. What does, uh, how does God speak to you? How does God speak to you? Would you like to answer that question? Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Gary. All right, now I'll speak. <laughs> um, I'm actually kind of, um, this, is, this is a really good one because it kind of addresses um, Will's question um, of what was, what was going on there. Um, there's a debate as to whether the scriptures um, exist as authoritative communication, you know, as in like, this is the declaration or the law that has been given by God to us, therefore we must follow, or whether they're a conduit by which God speaks to us directly. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's kind of, and, and in that sense, um, the word scripture kind of suddenly becomes this broad thing because the canon that we have wasn't really recognized as being, you know, the scriptures are this and this only. That's kind of a later convention. Um, you know, Paul talks about in Romans of the universe, the world itself, creation is the voice of God speaking to us and that God's divine attributes are revealed in the things that are. And so there's a sense that God speaks to us extra biblically through the experience of life. Um, and there's, in that sense, kind of addressing Will's statement, you know, why did God wait 200,000 years or however long it is? It's that God has continuously been speaking to us. And now through the scriptures, we have maybe a, a clearer revelation or, you know, a mode, maybe we're looking at the experience of other people who have listened to God. And so are we, are, do the words of scripture, are they the words of God or are they descriptions of other people's struggles trying to listen to the words of God? It's a shared human experience. You know, that's, this is a, one of the perspectives of scripture is that it's not necessarily a dictatorial authoritative thou shalt, but rather it's a description of the human experience as we wrestle with trying to understand how God speaks to us through creation or through the universe or in whatever ways. And so it's a shared no, experience I, where we're wrestling in communion with, with others. Yeah. Yeah. And like, can I just ask a question pertinent to my initial question, Srikant, or we'll come, we'll come to that. We'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an entire section on God and science and God. Okay. And in, in that section we'll answer, but right now the question on the table, it, is how does God speak to you? Grant, how does God speak to you? Oh, okay, um, briefly, um, God does not speak to me. I would challenge any and all assertions that God speaks to anyone. Sure. Uh, in the Quran, for example, uh, there is um, um, the angel that came to Muhammad. So there are, uh, there is 
people talking about spirits that come and talk to them. And I believe that that's true uh, because I have experience in this, this area. But if you look at the idea that God actually speaks to people, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. For example, um, there's no evidence that one religion or church is better than another. If you compare them all, they're all at the same base level. None of them walk on water. None of them do okay. anything special. And there is nothing, when a person says they talk to God or have a personal relationship with God, aside from certain eff effects in their immediate life, um, they don't cure cancer. They, they don't come up with Understood. anything that is really useful. Thank you. Next up is David, followed by Joe. David. Um, you know, to, to me, I, I, I triangulate, you know, um, the words of God goes back to the beginning in Moses, where in uh, chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, 18, 18 of Deuteronomy, it says that God is talking to Moses and he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you, Moses. And he says, I'm going to put my words in his mouth, into this prophet's mouth. And okay, and the thing is, everything that he, anybody, let's see. Anyway, it goes on to say that anybody that does not listen to this prophet is going to be held accountable to their own words. So the thing is, what he's saying is that this prophet, to me, is Jesus Christ, because it's acknowledged in John by several of the disciples referring to Jesus Christ as that prophet. And even the girl, at the, the lady at the well, at Jacob's well, she acknowledged that Jesus was this prophet. Now, the thing is, the triangulation goes to uh, next to Jesus Christ and his teachings in Matthew, where he gives actually a completion of the law of Moses uh, with, on the tablets of Moses, uh, beginning in the Sermon on the Mount, where he's talking about murder, about killing people, where he says, you know, a, a person is not only going to be held to the judgment of murder, but also if you're angry at somebody, too. So he holds his disciples to a very high standard of having to take and talk with other disciples or whoever you have something wrong with, okay, that you, you don't get along with to come to some kind of an agreement, okay? This almost goes along with the Socratic method that, uh, that Socrates teaches. And then the thing is, the, the real kicker to the whole thing is when you're involved into this issue and all of a sudden you see the reality of what is really true with what you've taken to the altar to be discussed. And you come back and all of a sudden realize that, hey, there's a truth there. And when this truth comes to light, to me, this is the Holy Spirit in a person's life. So you got these three different things that actually exist that can be verified, uh, actually only be verified by you. If I'm taking an ask and shriekant, because he lives a different life. So his experiences and his uh, truths are gonna be different than mine. But the thing is, you know that these things actually come from a spiritual being and through the definition that we're given by Jesus Christ and by Moses and by the Holy Spirit, these things are really true. Um, and they can only be recognized by an individual. I mean, because if you don't accept any of this stuff, then none of it's gonna be true, period. You won't ever see it. So thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so Joe, how does God speak to you? So um, when I think of this, I just think of the idea of grace is perhaps the best way to explain it. Um, that we come to certain things through reason um, and that there is an unfolding and as David was actually uh, talking about, uh, where there's a truth that is revealed to you, um, so that God is speaking to you by revealing truths in the world. Um, and in this case, this is as to why uh, often religious individuals will, will always say that there's no conflict between um, uh reason and 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 and, re and revelations uh so that they're 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 and divine revelations i'm sorry uh so that there's like they're they're they work in unison with one each other each other so this is how god speaks to someone um that's how i would uh 
I mean, that's how I would say God. If you have a personal relationship with God, um, that's how God speaks to you. Wonderful. Uh, Jacob, you have put some things in the chat. Would you like to answer the question, how does God speak to people or how does God speak to you? Well, first of all, there's no you. The Bible says, the New Testament says, you have died. The flesh has been crucified. The old self is dead. So there is no you. There's only one. Your brain body becomes the very embodiment of God in the flesh on the earth. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jacob. Appreciate that. So uh, I'll, I'll attempt my own answer to the question and then we'll go to the next one. So how does God speak to people? How does God speak? God speaks through the word. And that is how God speaks to us. It is the word made into flesh, whether in Genesis, whether God is speaking and is creating everything, and you see God through the creations, you try to figure out God through the creations. Then he speaks to some people who are prophets in the middle, and they try to speak to other people. And then he tries to speak. Then he speaks finally the word that becomes flesh. And in the person, through the, through the words of that person, through the actions of that person, through the love of that person, God speaks. So God speaks through the word that becomes flesh. That's the most direct speech of God of to people. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, the last question, let's handle what does it mean to know God? What does it mean to know God? Would you like to answer that? Evanik. I think that's so per it's for me it's personal. So um can you rephrase the question one more time? It just dropped out of my brain. What does it mean to know God? I think what it means to know God is to know yourself. And the Bible, it talks about, um, you know, that you are a child of God. And in a sense, it, and I think it was in the Gospel of John, where it was close to Jesus's crucifixion, he talks about, you know, you are God because you are a child of God. You are in a sense of God. So to know yourself is to go, know God. Now, the question then becomes, how does one know oneself? I, I think that's the hardest question. But I think the answer is you learn every day and you accept yourself for who you are in the moment. And I think you seek growth. And I think it's not so much about, um, I think it's about knowing yourself and I think if you know yourself, you definitely know God. But I think it's being open to it. And it doesn't have to be Christ, I don't think. I, I, I think it just, like you said, Shurika, you're always seeking and you're always looking for that knowledge and you're always learning about who God is and the nature of God. And that happens in so many different ways, talking to people. Um, you know, Jesus always talks about, you know, treating others as yourself um how you treat people that's how you know god you know getting to know other people that's how you know god because they are also god and i think knowing different people helps you to know god because then you know different aspects of god but i think it's more of you're always seeking and you're always constantly constantly getting to know god on a deeper level you're always seeking to go towards the center or towards the heart, as it talks about in Christianity a lot, you know, um, it, it, you know, there's this scripture that talks about the Pharisees where it talks about, you know, Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, right? Because, you know, they have all the rules, they know all the rules, 
they can follow all the rules, but they don't get it. They don't get anything. And then there's people that, you know, don't know any of the rules, but their heart is in it. And because their heart is in it, like the woman who gave the last two pennies, she gave it out of her heart. And Jesus like that was the biggest, that was worth more than what anybody else ever gave. So I think that's it. You just kind of have to keep going deeper. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Um, so the question on the table is, what does it mean to know God? Next up is going to be Gary uh, and David. Gary. Um, yeah, I was just, um, like I mentioned to you, Shikant, um, that I preached on Job for church, you know, two weeks ago. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because in his suffering, so it starts off, Job is servant of God. You know, he says, look at my servant. He's the best one there is. And so this is somebody who presumably knows God. Um, but in the midst of his, his suffering, um, that's Job's big complaint is like, where are you, God? you're 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 so distant from me i could never know you um you know somebody has to mediate between us you know and what what does that look like um and so i, I think you kind of nailed it when he talked about the word you know in there and I, th I think i think what's what's significant about job and what's significant about the cross and and for me um you know, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, there's this this idea where, you know, I kind of really sympathize with Grant is that's the question is, is can God be known? And does, does God speak to us in an intelligible way that makes sense to us? You know, even Jesus on the cross feels that alienation right there. Um, you know, that's that's uh, Philippians 2 when it talks about emptying himself you know, to that point of, of, of even death on a cross, you know, that, that point of alienation. Um, and that's really kind of the quandary of Job is like, where is God when it matters most? And, and the reality of the human experience is that when we do suffer and we do feel pain, that is when God really feels the most distant. And maybe it's at those moments that we have to, we have to make that leap of faith that he's really there. You know, and that's 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 the kind of maybe the hope of the cross is that, you know, God is there and loves us so much that he incarnated himself to experience what we feel so that we can know that that we're suffering together with God. You know, it's not just not a top down thing. So it's so I'm on the fence. You know, I don't I don't want to pretend to know God. I will certainly admit to feeling alienated and unknown by God and not knowing God, especially when I struggle. <laughs> that's that. But beyond that, I think, I think a lot of this is like when life is comfortable, we have this in intellectual speculation about the meanings of words in the Holy scriptures, you know, and what they all are. The reality of the experience might be, might be where is God when it hurts? You know, when does it matter most to you? that there is a God, you know, when, when is, when is that most meaningful might be the question. I don't know. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I really like this entire range of, uh, range of thoughts here. Uh, next up is uh, David Miller. What does it mean to know God? Well, I want to take up Evanique's uh, point of, uh, of knowing thyself. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, scholars, including the, the, uh, the feminist theologian like Professor Elaine Pagels, uh, uh, claim that John's gospel was written to oppose the viewpoint that Evanique put forward. Uh, it was written to oppose those Christians. And of course, as we know, there were umpteen dozen varieties of Christianity in the early church, uh, which we murdered when we joined up with the Roman emperors. Uh, anyway, they were claiming that, you know, you've got God within. And the way to salvation is to go 
to God within. Or know thyself, as Evanik was expressing it. So they're claiming that John's gospel is saying, no, you can't achieve salvation. You can't <laughs> by going within. You can only achieve salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the only way to salvation. You cannot achieve salvation by going within, to the God within. Now, of course, why it's claimed by them, by these theologians, that St. John's Gospel was a power grab, was that <laughs> who are Christ's spokespeople? Who has the apostolic succession, as we now call it? The bishops. They are the spokespeople right for short, Jesus. Um, David, go ahead. Uh, keep it short. Keep, try to wrap it okay. up in a minutes. Go ahead. Well, that, well, well, that's it. It's a power grab, they claim. John's gospel was a power grab which put the power, the only means of getting to Jesus Christ was via the priesthood, via the bishops. Because <laughs> they are the spokespeople, the only ones with the apostolic succession. So it's claimed, as I just said, <laughs> that it was written to oppose that viewpoint of many Christians, maybe the majority, because we, our variety of Christianity is only because the Roman emperors picked it. Um, yeah, so, you know, so it was written to oppose the concept of the going, getting salvation by the God within. It's only through Jesus Christ, which means only through the bishops. It was a power grab. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and try to answer, uh, give my own answer here. I think that is what is unique to Christianity as I understand it. You know, Christianity is interpreted basically by every philosophy uh, in a very different way. Okay. This is my understanding of it. I'm not no theologian. Um, it is a combination of divine. It's 100% divine, 100% man. That's the 100% God, 100% man. That's the core idea. 100% universal, 100% particular. It is the idea of theosis, the universal operating in the present, here and now. It is not escaping from physical reality in order to become spiritual, but it is spiritualizing the physical reality. It is union of the two, what, you know, what is being said here. Uh, this is the question, you know, David phrased it as Socrates. It's just Plato pretending to be, you know, uh, getting, trying to get glory of Socrates by using his name, but the separation of spirit and matter is the platonic idea. And that is also the idea that some of the people that David was talking about was holding that you will get to your spirit by saying no to matter. The separation between saying no to this world in order to get to the spirit. And this entire approach of Gospel of John and Christianity as best as I understand it, it is the union. It's Aristotelian in that sense of saying spirit and matter so then coming back to the question what does it mean to know god um now one hand on one hand god the father you can't see the ultimate universal principle that is shaping everything you can't see directly it's not perceptible you need an intermediary, you need something. And what the Bible is saying that the intermediary is a concept, it is a word that captures the nature, the universal nature in itself. So you can grasp it with your mind and you can live according to it. The idea of word becoming flesh 
is a profound act of love for the world. It's God so loved the world. It is the universal coming down to the earth. It's most of the pagan religions are about going up. This is about coming down. It is the, the universal coming down and embracing the world. So what does it mean to know God? Um, the only God that is accessible to you is the word made flesh. Because he is the mediator. Because he's 100% man. So he's like you. So you can see in his speech. You can see in his emotions, his love, his devotion. You can see in his action. What does it mean to be as God? It's an ideal that is presented to you in a form that Job is asking for. Job is saying, God, the universal principle, you're up there. How can I know you? And it's, I really want to know you. I'll do anything, but I can't know you. The word becoming flesh is an answer to Job. It is universal, made particular. And you can see it. So what, what is being said here is that some of us, our ability is very limited. We can see things in action and you can say, oh, that's what is meant. So it's a grand demonstration in action. You can perceive love a little bit better than you can perceive universal principles. So it is showing you how your emotions need to be. It's saying, love one another like I love the Father. So it's transmitting the love between the Word and the Father to human being. That love between the Son and the Father. And it's a reciprocal love. It's going back and forth. Is the Holy Spirit. That is the love. That is the wind. That is the Spirit. And all that Christ is trying to do is to give you give us that. That's it. Because if you have that, that is God. God is spirit. And you worship in spirit, you love in spirit. So how do you, what does it mean to know God? It means to know, know Christ because he's the intermediary. And what does it mean to know? Again, you know, know the words are very, it's, it is kind of having the experience and if you have that experience in that moment, I, mean, I see this as an eternal issue that is available to you at every moment. So to the extent to which you have the universal acting in you, killing off things that are not aimed towards the universal, letting them go. And that's why the blood... <laughs> You know, that's why the cross, that is the cross. You know, you're letting go of that. And in that letting go, your consciousness is born, your volition is born. So it is really about the birth of consciousness. It is about consciousness of universal principle that is shaping everything. And why is it that? It can be done because it is the universal principle that created all these things in the first place, which is making the same things known to us, accessible to us. It is the mediator. It is mediating between, you know, things in life which are at a very bad state. You know, he goes not to the kings or the priest. He goes to the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And he speaks to them. Um, next up is uh, Gary. Gary, go ahead. Oh, I don't. I don't oh. think it's me. I think it's Joe. Oh, it's Joe. Okay, sorry. Oh, I think it's me, oh, actually. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Will. Will, go ahead. That's Will. Yeah, don't forget the atheists. Thanks very much. Thank you. How convenient. 
So well, how, does, how, how does how uh, does what does it mean to know God, uh, Will? Well, just I just wanted to comment on what David Miller said so well uh, that the power was wrestled like it was a power grab by the bishops because uh, common knowledge actually is that a lot of Christianity was based around meditation and contemplation uh, historically in the Dark Ages meditation contemplation you came to new god and nature this way but then um something else prevailed and that was an overriding factor in all of human behavior that the gazumps it aces it trumps it beats all religion and that is evolutionary behavior traits that have been selected for over millions of years of evolution millions of years i mean homo sapiens have been on the planet two hundred thousand years and bipeds biped hominins have been on the planet for seven million years according to anthropological paleontology we've been walking for seven million years so all the traits that were selected in those seven million years have been for power and i would assert that everything is a will to power as is most religion. And unfortunately, religion has been rested for the specific power of individual, usually males of the species, and they don't give a flying frog for the natural realm itself. And it's such a great shame because if there is any God, it certainly is in the fabric and the intricacies of nature and the laws of physics and the majestical propensity of DNA to self-replicate. Yet small-minded, narrow-minded, egotistical, narcissistic megalomaniacs, of course, as has been selected for by millions of years of evolution, have hijacked the whole show and made it about themselves. Because I would assert that nearly everything we do, including these meetings, is ultimately a will to power. And such is a detriment of all. So I'll just end it there. But I'd say everything's a will to power. It's been selected for because we can't override uh, evolutionary drives. And this is another detrimental aspect of theology. They try to deny the dark side. They try to demonize people for having natural desire. And the church will tell you this is evil and you will go to hell if you have a natural desire. And they'll chuck people under the bus, gay people, anyone, the people that are promiscuous, under the bus, you're going to hell. This is a will to power, and it is to the great detriment of, of, of human beings and to the planet itself. 200 species a day are going extinct. No Thank one cares. You. No one cares. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Maybe we could uh, do these questions because it looks like David, Grant, and Will are making the same point about um, can you, put, you know, where does science, how does science integrate with Christianity? So maybe we can take that up as a question, but let's finish uh, everything. Um, let's go to Joe next. Joe, uh, back to your question of what does it mean to know God? I mean, I think to know God is to love God, which means that how does that manifest itself in the world? It manifests itself through virtue and how we interact with each other. So the idea that you can then uh, demonstrate things like uh, compassion and forgiveness uh, for every individual. And you can accept uh, what has been sent your way. Um, and uh, that's the idea of uh, embracing, uh, embracing God's will or faith, if you will, you know, depending on. And then uh, I think it also has to be uh, something that's directly related to uh, 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 what is true. And I think that that's um, what is true is, is uh, depending on your belief system, again, it, it all matters. Um, uh, is what is how do, is coming into the light is basically coming away from the darkness. That's the way I would phrase it. Is essentially 
moving away from the material world that are like not necessarily the promises of of their empty promises and moving more towards um uh the other things that we had discussed whether it be um kindness humility you know things along those lines and 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 virtue uh so that that's the way i would say and you're coming into the light there's a transformation but that's ultimately if you truly know god you then see god in everyone um and then and if you're able to do that um then you're able to live uh, uh pretty freely pretty freely thank you thank you joe um all right now we have two choices and i want uh, people's thoughts about it we are now going directly into conflicts okay we, we've kind of established we've talked about god and man's relationship to god uh this is a good kind of starting point um mike you had something mike go ahead you can take up to two minutes if you want three minutes go ahead well, this time I'll start with one minute, but I think I need 10 minutes for this point. No, no, we can't do 10 minutes. We can't. Oh, wait, do you, wait do you hear the point. Wait do you hear the point. Uh, this uh, ties back to yes, your... Two minutes. Go ahead. I'll give you one minute and then you can decide sure. what sure. might be on the rate. Okay. This goes back to your discussion about metaphor. Um. Uh, Let's take the situation which I got out of Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet's soliloquy. Um, if uh, there are sentient beings in another galaxy five billion light years away, considering God's universal love, which Gary can, can attest to, uh, or Gary, is Gary, yeah, Gary's still here. Which uh, did and the, this planet Arcturus in a hundred uh, in a hundred billion light years away, did Christ die for their sins too? And scholars at a um, at Opus Dei in the Catholic Church says yes, and basically they're saying this is all metaphor. And uh, there's a godlike hole in the middle of your conscience that uh, that uh, either evolved or uh, by by some uh, rules uh, automatically, or God specifically put it there. Okay. So that uh, that says that uh, for us, um, uh, God uh, 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 taught. Uh, during um, um, during Pentecost, the twelve different di disciples, the entire gospel in uh, in twelve different languages, and sent them out to see. And he just did that in uh, in 150 microseconds, like you download to a computer. Uh, and if you had a, a multiprocessor system. This is how you would uh, clone that system and Thank you. modify it for the context. Thank you. It's two minutes, um, okay. oh my. But let, let me, hear, you, you, this is an important point. This is very good, uh, Mike. Point. But let's let's look at the discussion in which let's take it along the lines of where various people want to go. Okay. okay. Uh, so let me go ahead. Um, so we have two choices now. Okay. There are. A bunch of questions about conflicts between like protestant and christian between um you know christianity itself you know why are there so many different kinds of christianity we have christians and pagans we have uh, maybe christians and greeks uh at like plato um so we are those kinds of conflicts okay that's, so that's one Second is several people here have raised a far more fundamental conflict because all of these are like variations of religions and Christianity. But several people here, like uh, Will and Grant and David Miller, have raised the question about, you know, natural metaphysics and Christianity. Where is 
why what is the basis of it so those are the two choices okay so we can talk you know conflicts within religion or between religion and secularism okay so choose whether you want within or without so within religion you can say within in you can say or you can say out go ahead and type it in chat and i'm just going to count um the number of votes and we will discuss whatever it is that people want to discuss uh mike go ahead and type it into the chat which or whatever you want to discuss so we got one vote so far out that's very good excellent welcome jason um go ahead uh, folks so okay we've got three outs no ins okay whatever the vote is we are going to discuss that uh please go ahead and put put your vote down i will defer to the majority of vote here okay that's a cop out uh, grant but i'm going to call call you know based on whatever you have said i'm going to consider it as a vote for out um okay uh we've got only five votes uh, out of 15 people we've got one more okay everybody is basically going for the out vote so we're going to go for that all right so now let's try to formulate the question fully okay um so try to just formulate questions okay what is the right question to ask here when you're trying to compare christianity with secular thinking what form would you like to answer ask the question don't comment anything just questions okay let's try to come up with the best formulation that we would like to discuss and we will go ahead and discuss it if you'd like to put your question down just go ahead and type exclamation mark speak out your question you don't have to type it just go ahead and type an exclamation mark what question should we discuss when we are discussing christianity and secularism christianity versus science christianity versus um modernity if you want I, whatever you want to call it so try to formulate how would you ask the question go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to will how would you formulate the question thanks Srikant. yeah i'm interested in um as per other discussions i've had on this subject that i remember someone said well just questions just try to just give me a question Okay, if there's no God, as this young man once said, how how do we know what to do? So some people, and I wonder if it's a personality type, sorry, question, how can we have a moral view of the world without why, no, sorry, why do we need God to be moral? And is this because of our primate origins, that we're, we're inherently evil and bestial, unless we believe in the sky fairy? Got it. Okay. We got one question. One. Oh, please go ahead and formulate. Next up is going to be Joe, Jason, Gary, and Jacob. Joe, how would you put the question down? I just had another thought. Um, so one of the original one I was going to ask is how uh, does community structure differ? Um, and, but the second one was more of... Um, yeah, and, and in basis on that, uh, how does community structure differ? And then how does that, when I say that, um, the doctrines that are being followed, uh, so that that, that the relig a religious doctrine versus a uh, obviously secular doctrine, and then how does that manifest itself? Uh, so the idea of um, religion, there's typically, typically a hierarchy. Okay, let, let's let's keep. I'm going to formulate it. In what uh, I'm going to reformulate it. So, folks, try to be brief because we have to get to a question. Um, so, the way I'm going to put uh, Will's question is: Do we need God for morality? And what uh, Joe seems to be asking is: Do we need God for community structure? So, it's, it's like relationship. You know, what what is a community structure in secular basis versus God basis, what is a morality with secular basis versus uh, religion, something like that. Those are the two forms. But if you want to formulate it better, go ahead and type it in, in chat. Jason, how would you frame this question about secularism versus religion? 
All right. So my question is actually triggered by what Will was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, <clears throat> mainly, so with regards to evolutionary theory and in relationship to the most vulnerable of society, so gays, um, uh, poor people, the disabled, just as an example, does evolutionary theory serve us well, serve those people well, as a overarching philosophy of morality beyond a scientific, a scientific rigorous, I would say, theory, right? So evolution as a science versus evolution as an overarching philosophy of how we should treat each other. How does it, does it serve the most vulnerable of society? Uh, and yes, as compared to Christianity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Next up is Gary, Jacob, and David Miller. Gary. Um, I, I guess this is, again, it's back to our discussion on John, is that the, the first century world had a metaphysics of, you know, how the universe ran. And it was actually quite evolutionary in its theory and and postulated that the mankind at its best, at its most flourishing, also demonstrates the virtues, you know, and that was independent of any Christian influence. Um, and so I guess, so I, where I'm coming from in this discussion, when I ask the question, how does the metaphysical nature of the universe in Christianity compare with the metaphysical nature of the universe outside? I'm really thinking of it in a first century context because we have 2000 years of garbage that we've attached to that question. We're comparing it modern evangelicalism, you know, with evolutionary science now, whereas a, what did original Christianity, how did they, because it, it really was quite in sync. It was making the statement, this is the nature of the universe and this is the nature of man. And to be the best possible human, this is what it means, What this is what that looks like. And so it's really, I guess that would be the question. What does the best possible human look like, whether we use an evolutionary or a Christian perspective, and how are they different? Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jacob. Jacob, would you like to read out your question? Yes, my question is, uh, what will make one capable of seeing truth, not of truth, seeing truth? And you can shorten it to actually what will make one capable of seeing. Okay. Thank you. David, go ahead. What's your question? How would you form the question? Well, I suppose the basic question is, um, can I have non-supernatural gods? Can gods be naturalistic? Um, are gods... Uh, really my my highest values, my loftiest ideals, my areas of ultimate concern, these I serve. I mean, I'll fight for them, die for them, perhaps even kill for them. I mean, they are, we could argue, the real gods. But, of course, they can be metaphorically personified. Uh, you know, I can, I can make it uh, Mother Nature is my, um, you know, area of ultimate concern. Uh, I don't see any problem with that, even from an atheist viewpoint, observing Mother Nature as long as it's seen metaphorically as, as a fiction. But, of course, the problem is that most people throughout history have um, given uh, those, um, those metaphors, um, you know, uh, they've made them supernatural. They've made them a, a being in their own right, like... Sure. Um, no, no, no. Uh, you, you put the question on the table. Can gods be natural? Can people hold supreme values which are not based on supernatural ideas? Excellent. Uh, next up is Mike. Mike, what's the question? I'll, I'll read it out for you. Go ahead, Mike. Just okay. the question. Well, how do you map the thought experiment so that the secularism and dogmatism are really the same? Okay. Uh, we, okay. we do not have an understanding of either of those. We have a mental map of what God is, a mind map of what God is. We have a mind map of what nature is. Both of those are uh, di uh, diverse from reality. Thank uh, you. 
Thank you, uh, Mike. Um, all right. So now let me try to summarize. I think this is this is a you know this is very very interesting. Okay. So I'm just going to try to try to see what is it that people are asking about. Okay. And what people seem to be saying here. Okay. I'm I'm going to just blurt out some things. I'm trying to see common patterns between them to try to come up with one question that can summarize all these questions, at least get maybe 50% of everything that everybody has asked for. So we had need for morality and whether we can get it from our primate heritage or do we need God for that? So morality is one thing. Second, is community structure, social structure. Do we need God for that? Do we need religion for that? Do we need secular for that? What, what, what is the difference? Uh, what is the relationship between evolutionary theory and morality? Is evolutionary theory sufficient for morality or does it need something else? How are the metaphysical nature, metaphysical nature different? So this is, so we need a metaphysics. So we need a morality. We need a social structure. We need a metaphysics. Um, the best possible human. Okay, so morality is one aspect of it. I would put it as an ethical ideal or supreme value. That's what um, David was talking about, supreme value and ideal. Okay, these are all various ways of referring to the same thing. Um, truth, we're talking about, you know, it's the way of seeing truth. Or there, we're talking about epistemology, you know, method of using your consciousness to get at truths. So truth or um, I'm just going to say epistemology. Okay. Um, and then we're talking about maps that is actually very close to epistemology or truth, you know, what with what we are trying to grasp, you know, map with which we're trying to grasp things. So I I'm going to use, you know, truths to be grasped through epistemology of mapping. Really? If you look at it, this is metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics. Okay, this is basically philosophy. So the question really is, and we can go across it, you know, in that because metaphysics is fundamental of saying, well, what kind of a world are we living in? Um, then, you know, how do we know it? Then what should we do? And how do we deal with each other, right? Um, so those are the questions. You know, what is this world? Metaphysics. How do we how do we know it? What should we pursue? What values should we pursue? Or virtues should we have? And how do we interact with one another? Now, so this is a group of things. And now we can look at the Christian approach to it. And we can look at not other religions, but a atheistic approach to it, scientific approach to it, whichever way what you want to call it. Now, try, let's first try to get facts on the table. I know that this is a very, very charged issue close to hearts of everyone on every side, okay? And one thing that we try to do here is to actually have a dialogue, okay? So this is really the most, one of the most ambitious dialogues that we have attempted. So let's attempt it. Start by steel manning both the things. So try 
to summarize. Don't try to say, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Don't, don't do that. Try to say, what is this one view? The Let's call it the secular and the religious, the secular and the Christian. Okay. So what does the secular view? How does it approach these four things, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics? And how does the Christian view approach it as best as you can? Now, it's it's actually a very, it's not a fair question because under secularism, there is all these philosophies that have different answers to all these four. Even versions of Christianity are very different on all these four, okay? So I don't know how we are going to do it. But that I see as the question. Um, so that's, it's, firstly, just... Is there a better way, do you think, of phrasing this question? So I'm, I'm proposing to phrase it in terms of on metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics, how do Christianity and secularism differ? That's what I want to put put down, okay? Um, and let's see, let's actually try to answer it and see what it is. Try to keep your answer short so we can keep coming back and refining the question and discussing it in a great amount of detail. All right, we're going to start with David Norton first. And then anybody who wants to, oh, wait a minute, DLJ. DLJ first, followed by David Norton. DLJ. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not going to tackle the whole thing there. Um, yes, you I'm, can I'm, pick any part. You can pick okay. metaphysics, epistemology, okay. ethics, politics. Just uh, check it. Out. Yeah, so I'll go with, go with the talk ethics. About one side or the other side. Anything that you want, but just okay. try to fix up, fit everything within two minutes. Go ahead. Oh, less than that. Um, I'm going to uh, go with the ethics part and tackle Jason's question. Um, evolution is not sufficient for, uh, for morality, uh, but what it will do is facilitate an explanation of what morality is and what it's for. And if you want the long version of that, I have a one hour presentation, which at least four people here have seen already. And I can explain the exact processes by which that actually happens. But I haven't got an hour, so I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is David Norton, Will, and Joe. Yeah, you know, um, I'm listening to there's so many different things here with this whole thing. It just goes in many different directions. So the best thing I can do is explain my understanding of what is being talked about here. And number one, I go back to the, what you had said earlier, uh, Srikant, about everything is in the word, period. Now, there's one word that is used to describe God, okay? And it's called Jehovah, or some use Yahweh, whatever. But the thing is, the meaning of that word means existence, period. And the thing is, we live in existence of this world, whether you look at it in the secular version, or through Christian eyes, or through Hebrew eyes, or... I don't care which set of eyes you may be looking at it, it exists, period. And the thing is, I think that there should be the focus, whether we're in a secular realm of it, or we're in a Christian realm of it, a Hebrew realm of it, or whatever. And through that, I think we can reach some kind of commonality that exists. Because with existence, I mean, it's like the sunshine. It's a sign, sun is existing. And we know there's certain things that are characteristic of our lives with that. You know, um, this is all representative of what we refer to as God on one hand and as nature on another hand and on existence in our own life. You know, so the thing is, to me, Christianity is merely an understanding of bringing this nature or this existence into light and into understanding as to what is really real about it versus what is not real about it. And that is found within the definition of the words. Now, whatever community a person belongs to will have a different definition for words and therefore see things in a different light. Um, so the, the key thing for community is common definition. Thank you. Know? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um... So I don't know how to, you know, it's going to be a very large discussion. Uh, we're going to start it off and then we'll see how, how we can how we can deal with it. Uh, next up is going to be Will. Will, what do you think these two approaches, how do they approach metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics? 
Yeah, well, I was just pondering, and it might tie in with what David just said, why those of faith, and sorry if this is not directly answering the question, I thought we were honing the, the question, and I was wondering, but it may tie in with what David just said, uh, why people of faith don't believe that those of no faith are capable of constructing a paradigm of morality, a, a, a set of rules that we need an omnipotent creator to tell us what to do. And, um, you know, atheists are seen as immoral quite often. So I'm wondering how, what is it about the need for God that, that what the, that says about a believer's uh, understanding of human nature? We think that we're, that we are all sinners and we're incapable of morality without uh, an external voice. Uh, so it's sort of about definition, which ties in a little bit with what David said, I believe. Thank you. Uh, next up is Joel. Um, so this is kind of, you know, a very difficult, obviously, and very large question. So uh, I'll just take the first crack at it from what I'm thinking. Um, as far as ways of knowing, uh, there's a lot of different um, approaches that we can explore that question. And I would say probably one of them would be uh, one sees there is order in the universe and the other one doesn't see order. So that there is a, that there's a living universe versus, um, uh, an, you know, just a random, uh, uh, randomness um that's that's the, that's one way i would answer it but i would as far as the ethics are concerned this is what i think is the most probably important um i think that ever anybody can live an ethical life as long as they're not dogmatic as long as they are open to new information and uh using um, uh, reason in their in their uh, decisions, um, and so uh, that's where I see is that either if uh, you're a community that's based on uh, faith, you know, of some sort, that that faith is open to interpretation. Um, if you are a community based on science and observation that that community be open to interpretation as well and i i think that that um ultimately drives something much deeper um and much more important uh is that is is there's an authenticity involved and if there is authenticity uh then you see either a from a more secular perspective, the inherent worth in everyone, or B, the God in everyone. So either way, that you have the ability to do, to act ethically. And I and and yes, it is possible to act ethically without a God. I've seen people that do that. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, next up is going to be Gary. Gary, go ahead. Um, I'm just like briefly kind of addressing, um, you know, Will's point that, um, that it, it's not, it, it's up for debate whether or not the Bible is prescriptive at all, or even intends to be prescriptive. It, it might just simply be descriptive. And it's, re and it's p positing itself as a competing theory, just as utilitarianism and deontology are competing with each other. Just as you know, you have Peter Singer on animal, animal cruelty. These are all just competing theories within science um, that don't even require the existence of a God to to discuss you know metaphysical things. It's just a, a different angle of looking at it, and they're they're taking the the evidence, the empiricism that they have at hand to postulate their theory, and that's why I was talking about it in first century Christian perspective because and that's why i compare it a lots of times with the stoics because that's really what they're saying is given the nature 
of the universe as we know it you know how ought we to live and 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 what's going on you know in the world the the event and this is where it kind of all starts off with with um that you you keep driving us back to and i thank you for it for shirkan is that where christianity centers around is a single truth claim and that is the cross and so we can get rid of all the prescription and you know whatever it else it is whether it's prescriptive or 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 descriptive or whatever at the core of Christianity is this event, you know, Jesus died, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. And it says, what does that say about the universe? And at that point, we can, you know, accept or reject the fruit, truth claim. But that's what, Christ, that's the fundamental core of Christianity is right there in the cross. Um, everything else, like I said, is, is, I'm really a fan of the early Christianity, you know, pre-Constantine christianity for the most part simply because there's so much garbage that just keeps getting attached to it and it's hard for us to even think of christianity without all of these other assumptions that that have been culturally imposed on us especially if, if we come from a western or white country um but that's just the nature of that um my two cents okay all right. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to attempt this uh, myself and then let's let's see what people have to say. I mean, look. Um, if you're trying to relate these two, probably the easiest way is to see people who embodied both kind of the highest of the secular. In Now I'm doing this in my my estimation and some of the highest in Christian thought in one person. And I think during enlightenment, you know, you have people like Jefferson, people like that, uh, people like Newton, a uh, little before that. Um, they have that. So first, let me start with metaphysics because you have to start with metaphysics because if you're different there, everything else is going to be different. So what is it that is common uh, to Newton, uh, Jefferson, and um, and what is being talked about in the Bible? Um, I mean, this is, again, my take. Again, my I don't understand the Bible that well. Um, and I don't understand these thinkers also uh, either. Um, I'm taking the idea of of, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with um, C.S. Lewis's book called Abolition of Man. And he essentially says, he calls it the Tao. He calls God the father of the Tao, and which is equivalent of nature. So the concept of nature, the same concept of nature that Newton had, the same concept of nature that Jefferson had, you know, that reality is what it is, it has certain laws. It is what it is. You have to respect it. You have to always start from it and keep going back to it. No matter what you come up with, you have to be willing to give that up to pursue it. This is also, I think, the heart of science. You know, my favorite quote from Newton this is at the end of his life, where everybody was saying, Oh, we have Newton's laws. Now we've figured out everything. He was saying that, you know, I don't know how other people see me, but as for myself, I seem to have been only like a little child, little boy playing on the seashore, but discovered some seashells shinier than others, while the entire ocean of truth lay undiscovered. Now, I completely, completely sympathize and empathize and wholeheartedly agree with that approach first of this awe of nature second of the humility of your own understanding of it and third your intense curiosity of discovering it um so there is that nature whether you call it the Tao or God the Father um, and that is like the core for both secular at its high point like Newton or Jefferson. Now, what has happened is that in modern world, 
what C.S. Lewis, I agree with him. He says, we have lost the Tao. We have actually lost nature itself. We are focused. We have just become an analytical people. We've kind of broken things down and we're trying to understand one piece, but you really can't understand it without understanding the whole. We're not looking for universal laws underlying nature itself. So we have given up being scientists and we think that we are actually we're using products of science of the past, but we're not being scientists. We have lost the curiosity. Uh, we've lost the humility. We have lost the awe of reality. Um, so that's on nature. And that view, I think, is very, to me, it's analogous to the approach to um, God the Father. The second one, is that a reason, okay? The way in which Christianity puts it, it is the idea of logos. Logos is the word, it's also the meaning, the structure. You're trying to discover the structure. You're trying to discover the meaning of it. And contained in there is the cross of saying anything that is not going towards the universal, anything that is not going towards the truth, I will give up. This is the corollary of what Newton is talking about. This is analogous to what Newton is talking about. That whatever I know is only shiny shells. Be willing to throw away anything in order to pursue the truth now. So there is a, that epistemic humility is contained in the cross. And that is the method. It's, it's about consciousness. Really, it is about consciousness of being aware. The active consciousness, not going by our tremendous biological strengths that we have. I mean, the evolutionary strengths are formidable. We have formidable evolutionary strengths. But those are all in Daniel Kahneman's terms, those are all system one things. What Logos is talking about, what science is talking about is system two. It's full of effort. It's full of sacrifice. It is full of taking the responsibility and paying the price at every moment. So that is the commonality that I see on epistemic level. Then it is, so I, I'll keep it at that. Then I, I we can talk further about the um, about the ethical ideal in Christianity and elsewhere, and the highest ethical ideals we see in other places. And then finally, if we have time, we can talk about the political um, issues. So, any thoughts on the metaphysics and epistemology of of secular epistemology? Or um, or Christianity. Any any thoughts, David? You had something, David Norton. Yeah, the, the, there's many many things in the words that you just said. You know, um, you know when you talk about Jefferson, you know, like he he wrote his own little Bible. You know, um, and basically what he did is he threw out everything except for the teachings of Jesus Christ, the words of Christ. You know. And then also the thing is you, you use that word and the word is used in the Bible called epistle, okay? The word epistle is actually two words, you know? The word epistle is where we get two English words. Um, they break it down into faith on one side and belief on the other, depending on the way it's actually said, okay? And the thing is when you focus on the gospels, Jesus talks about belief, when you focus on the epistles, we're talking about faith. There's two different things there, okay? Because faith is something that you believe in that you really don't know. But when you believe something, there's no doubt in your mind that it's there. So you got two different things found in the same word that we're actually talking about here, you know? Uh, so it's like, you know, two different things. But what struck me more than anything else, because we're talking about the outside of of Christianity as we know it. And to me, as some people have mentioned here, that before Christianity took its institutional form through the Roman, um, you know, declaration of what was the Bible, okay, there was a lot of different things that were going on there. And the thing is, these things here are just beginning to be discovered. 
And actually, if you take and dig... Let's not go into details of Christianity because we are looking at Christianity and secular comparison between the two. Well, that is sort of, but I'll end with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Folks would love to hear what, what you guys think about uh, both kind of, you know, the view of nature itself, of Christianity versus secular views, or of way of discovering it. Um, any Anything anybody wants to say? Suddenly everybody is quiet. Don't know what happened. Uh, let's see here. Well, I mean, just if there's a pause there, I'll just throw okay. this in. I'm sorry if it's not particularly relevant. I'll just say it because it, there's a pause. But I get, I'm still wondering what if believers, people of faith, if they, what is the fundamental reason why we can't agree on morality without okay, let's let's go to uh, okay let's see if uh, joe has something and then we'll go to the topic of morality that's the next one we're trying to do it in the systematic way uh next up is going to be joe and then we'll go to morality joe sorry so i'm just going to make a really quick comment about the idea that uh there is still the idea of natural law that is practiced both in a secular way and as well as a religious way um and that kind of dictates how we view others and see others um and that inherently that uh we're pro-social uh and um uh that we are we have the capability of being rational and uh are that capability um, allows us to cooperate in ways that allow us to move forward. So that's I'm I'm just putting that out there as one thing that you know Aquinas that was written about, but so the Stoics, and so that there it's there, there's an overlap there. And I understand not everybody believes in natural law, but that that's just something I'm throwing out there as far as the metaphysics are concerned. Excellent. Okay, so it looks like everybody wants to discuss morality. So let's maybe we'll get better discussion on morality. So we've gone through like quickly on, I'm not happy at all with our discussion on epistem uh, epistemology. I don't think I did a good job either because there is a lot more. There is like a whole theory of induction and there is like mapping and territory on all of those things. And there is a equivalent of that in Christianity. Uh, so all of that needs to be mapped out much more, but let's talk about um, talk about exactly the thing that David Miller wants to talk about as he's about to leave. Um, so the question is about ideals. Let's put it as a as a question. Where do ideals come from? What is it? You know, what are the highest values? Um, you know, Grant says uh, we all need more of them. I'm sure you know. We'll also start by saying, look, we need need values. Um, so the the question, so let, let's talk about morality. Morality, there are many secular bases for morality. You know, there is the Stoics, there is the, you know, Aristotelian, there is, you know, there's all kinds of uh, things. So would love to hear your thoughts about morality or ideals. Morality, instead of morality, let's start with ideals because people get all people find it difficult to talk about morality but i let's say about ideals what is it that you aim at you know what's the highest possible and how do you how do you conceive of it um so any any thoughts about that either on the christian basis or secular basis or the comparison between them will i'll i'll go i'll go to you next i interrupted you a couple of times when you were off the topic this is the topic that you've been trying to push towards please say something now we're on topic of might have forgotten what I wanted to say, but which, well, mine was more of a question. It, it, just what does it say about human nature that our values and and uh, our our moral compass is not adequate enough uh, with a secular uh, perspective? Without for us to need uh, to need an omnipotent, omniscient, benevolent uh god to tell us what to do to lay down the rules so i just wonder what people believe and those of faith 
uh, believe about human nature that we can't work it out for ourselves. Uh, so where are our values? Like, why can't we just have values that are benevolent, compassionate? And I would argue that most people of, uh, you know, in the scientific world, in the medical world, you know, they're not necessarily religious at all, if the if if the truth be known. So I think it's quite apparent that we don't need a set of rules, uh, doctrine. But I wonder why believers think we do need God. Because I did hear somebody say recently as a young guy in one of these discussions, and he said, well, if there's no God, how do I know what's right? I can do anything I want. And I thought some people must actually think like that. And perhaps this is what those of faith are actually afraid of. And I wonder if perhaps the beast of the Old Testament, the beast, uh, might be our primal nature. And if you contain the beast, put the beast in a cage, what happens with any poor beast that's put in a cage? It goes crazy. And when it gets out of the cage, it it it, 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 um, it wreaks havoc. And I think this is one of the problems with, with the churches. They try and keep our primal nature uh, in a cage and tell us that we're all born into sin and they rule, they rule with guilt and fear. And um, this is this is very destructive, I would say. So I wonder what is it that value that the theology theologians see as being uh, corrosive? It, it, we must deny our, our natural nature, perhaps. Thank you, uh, thank you, Will. Um, Will uh, I'm going to uh, ask people to just talk about morality. You're welcome to address the question that Will has put on the table. Uh, Mike, you got two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, I'll stay within two minutes and not argue for more. Um, you mentioned Newton. Uh, Newton, Descartes, Leibniz didn't consider a difference between morality, religion, and science. Uh, in fact, uh, they probably wrote more about morality and religion than they did about science. And um, so uh, they considered this a continuum. You mentioned Kahneman. He he can, he um, had uh, he wrote a little bit about religion. Uh, he he came from uh, he got his science uh, initially from his experience with the Israeli army as a teenager. Uh, so at any rate, he. Uh, uh, the, and I, I, uh, Kahneman didn't get to talk to uh, the other three, but Leibniz, Leibniz, uh, Descartes, uh, Newton, and Spinoza uh, uh, had a, uh, uh, a fruitless effort to try and get all the religions universalized and back together again. And they had dialogue and uh, letters, which are uh, which are around in some of the libraries in France. Thank you. Uh, one more thing: uh, Nietzsche did not uh, said if if uh, religion if there is no God, he really didn't say God is dead. He said if, uh, uh, in German, he said if there is no God, then anything goes. He also said that if you drink from the cup of knowledge, you realize that you don't need God anymore. But as you get to the bottom of the cup, you find God lurking in all the nooks and crannies. That didn't get translated in the modern version. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, next up is going to be Joe. Joe, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, it, as far as morality goes, uh, it, there's obviously there's there's a different schools of thought, uh, different values. Uh, so there are virtue ethicists, there are deontological uh, believers, and utilitarians. I mean, those are three major ones that I that I'm familiar with. Consequentialist, whatever you want, however you want to say. It. Um, and those are the values that they're going to guide their decisions. Um, I think that, uh, you know, these obviously come into conflict, uh, at, at different points. 
Uh, the deontological, I find it very difficult because I don't see it as an open system. Um, I see it as something that we're, there are moral absolutes and I don't necessarily believe that to be true. Um, but uh, I also believe there has to be a certain degree of humility, which is why we, I believe in relying on principles um, in the sense that how um, how much we actually understand about the world uh, so that we you know, kind of have to rely on virtue. That's what, well, you know, everybody has that my perspective. So um, those are the three ethical systems. Um, you know, again, uh, uh, they, they have different, I mean, they're very, we can, they're all a meetup onto themselves. Uh, but um, that's the way I see morality is as far as how, it manifests itself in the world. I mean, I think everybody kind of understands those three categories, but that's the way I'd break it down. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, let's see. Uh, Jacob, would you like to share what you put in the ch chat? You don't have to, but you're, you're welcome to do so. Okay. Well, right. it's quite a lot. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, someone just mentioned humility. Uh, and do we understand what true humility is? It means freedom, it means a brain that is totally free of conditioning, of filters, of the I, the me, the self. The cross symbolizes the wiping out of the I, which is an illusion put together by thought. Thought invented it. So when the mind is not, moral action is happening. The mind is the block. The me, the I, the self is the block. When, when the brain is free of the mind, then it gives birth to the big mind, the mind of nature, the natural, the movement of the natural mind of God, if you will, if you want to call it that. God being the all. All is all there is. And we are part of it. We are that. We are the whole. As Rumi said, we are not a drop in the ocean. We are the whole ocean in the drop. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Jacob. Really appreciate that. Next up is Jason. Jason, go ahead. All right, so uh, I feel bad that no one's really made a real attempt to answer Will's question from a personal standpoint yet, so I'll just start from a personal standpoint. Um, as a person of faith who came to faith in college, um, I will say, yeah, I did have a moral, moral compass, moral barometer um, before I you know, found God, so to speak. Um, so I'm still kind of light. Um, and I do believe, and I would say most people of faith um, and I'm sorry on behalf of all Christians if we haven't conveyed this. I, I would say most of us do believe that atheists, secularists, agnostics, humanists, that they do have a moral compass. Uh, you know, and again, uh, we, we should do a better job of conveying that belief if, you know, if what I'm saying is true. Um, I think where I personally come down is um, prior to having, I look at my faith as just a, as a as, as a programming system to underline uh, my hardware, my my instincts, my my primal urges, um, uh, it, it helps me to make sense. So, so prior to coming to faith, for example, many people would look at me as a good guy. Like I looked at myself as a good guy. Um, I was I had a good reputation amongst my friends and uh, the college campus as a whole, and uh, and I, I I worked hard to keep it that way. But I knew myself deeper than anyone else did of course and and i knew that so it was it was certain habits i don't need to get into the particulars but we all know we all have our vices that lead to um that that can still fall within the bounds of so we have outward morality outward actions that may look virtuous that may look um appropriate socially right but we all have our our again um 
again, I like Will's language, our, our, our bestial uh, ways, right? That, that can lead to uh, destructive uh, destruction within relationships, destruction mainly within relationships, but even just to ourselves. Um, and beyond just actions, it's ways of seeing people. Um, and that's what Christianity gets at the heart of. It's not just how you act. It's really how you see other people, how you see the world. Um, and again, uh, Will, I keep talking, I keep referring back to what you said, because you brought up a lot of good points. And um, uh, and which ring true to both the atheist that still lives within me, let's be real, and also, um, you know, the idea of, yeah, how Christians treat the, the most vulnerable. It should bother all of us. Uh, the way the loudest voices within Christianity treat those who can, who are marginalized in society. Um, there's what we see as the behavior of so many, of some loud Christians. And then there's what, um, there's what the heart of Christ actually is in the ideal way that it should, that it, that I believe it should be interpreted. And the ideal way that I believe that, um, it, it should be it should be conveyed and communicated, and it's not it's often not done that way. So, going back to your original point, um, yeah, I think most of us do believe that atheists do have a moral compass. I think it's in those difficult times. So again, for me, uh, there was times of deep depression uh, prior to coming to faith, and even during my walk in faith as well. Let's be real, mental illness is a thing that can occur at any time, but it's when all the niceties of life are stripped away. Um, as individuals that uh, are more a compass that I found myself personally, it lacked an undergirding foundation. Uh, and yeah, maybe it needed a sky fairy to help me uh, orient that compass a bit better. Um, maybe it did, but it's on an individual basis, but also as a societal basis. We have, I think we have a privilege of living in a culture and a, and a time in history that we have the most privilege and the most, I guess, nice things that we've, that any human society has ever had in all of history. And we, I think we take for granted, and certainly I did prior to coming to faith, that so many things in society and so many social mores and um, just, we're so accultured to have a moral compass that I think we, um, it's easy to ignore that those that the morality may have and maybe ought to have a source, right? So again, I'll just make a quick example of uh, why should we treat disabled people, like truly disabled people, with care and respect and compassion? Survival of the fittest under that system, they're not that fit. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone here, but we are all temporary able-bodied, right? That's the, the best thing I've heard. We will all be one day disabled. And I, I have trouble as someone who, I, I believe in many elements of evolution, many elements of survival of the fittest. Um, but that alone for me cannot be the be all end all philosophy. It is a great scientific set of principles, but for me, I needed something more as a philosophical overlay onto that. For me to live the way, with the results that I ha currently have, I am in a parallel universe had I never come to faith. My morale, moral compass, I don't think would have led to the, the otherwise very good results that I have now. Um, I'm not sure I'd even still be alive, if that makes any sense. So sorry for the long-winded response, but thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I uh, really appreciate that.